you want to come on over here, we're going to take a look at some of the vernal pool plants that we have out here. This is interesting because it changes, um, especially with the windy days we have, it changes very rapidly. We were out here earlier this week and uh, there are plants that I was looking at just a week ago that have already uh, passed on to the next stage of their life. So, Sabrina, how close can you get to this? Okay. What we have here, if it shows clearly, these are popcorn flour and uh, very tiny. So I have a scale here. The scale's uh, an inch. The, each of those marks is a 32nd of an inch. So you can see they're quite tiny. This is a Plagiobothrus species. There's uh, quite a few different Plagiobothrus species in California. Uh, many of them are adapted specifically for vernal pools. Um, it's hard to tell what the species is. You can see the size of this flower. To be able to tell what species it is, I have to look at the fruit of this uh, under a, a dissecting scope, and that's very difficult. So um, if the moderator can show us a picture of a popcorn flower. OK, so we're having a little bit of a connection problem here. One of the problems with doing field work like this with with, um, with Zoom is that sometimes we lose our connection. So we're looking at a picture of a popcorn flower. Okay. While we're working on getting our connections, another flower that we have nearby here. We'll move over a little further. Okay, so if we can show my camera, there we go. We have an interesting look. It looks like a little bit of fuzz here. And this is something that's called woolly marbles. Woolly marbles, again, um, several species of this. Uh, this is probably Silocarpus bevisimus, but it's hard to tell. A lot of the plants are smaller than usual uh, this, this season. Um, it's in the Asteraceae. It's a, it, we see a lot of it around vernal pools nearby. And um, if the moderator can show us a photo of uh, woolly marbles, that would be helpful. And there's probably three different species out here. This one has uh, shorter bracts, so it's probably the one that we're going to have the photo of here in a second. That's the popcorn. There we go. There's the woolly marbles. And also, I'm going to apologize to folks. There's a slight lag between what I see on the screen here and, and what I'm talking. So woolly marbles is 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 uh, something you really only find in or immediately adjacent to a um, rental pool. So another one we're going to show, and let's we can just go right over to this one right here. Here's one that was wasn't actually blooming just a few days ago. This is a Navaritia, a white-headed Navaritia. It's a delicate little white flower on a on a poofy, spiny-looking plant. Um, several species of Navaritia in California. This particular one is a white-head Navaritia, and okay, we lost our connection again here. So, um, if the moderator can show us a picture of the Navaritia, um, delicate little white flower, a little bit bigger flower than the popcorn flower. Uh, there are several different subspecies of this, and it's really difficult to tell the different subspecies apart. This possibly is um, Navaritia leucophila. Uh, subspecies Bakeri, and if it is, then it's a very rare plant, something that we only see in a few places. Okay, so there's there's our Navaritia uh, stuck in amongst some popcorn flour and other things, and you can see this this clay here. This is this is the the clay pan, very very um, hard soil. Uh, the clay. Is are particles that, that washed down thousands, tens of thousands of years ago from 
the coastal range, where which are sandstone, and we're getting pretty close to the edge of where we'll see the uh, this fine clay. It does reach out into the Yola Bay bypass as well. Uh, very very fine clay. When it gets a little bit damp, it bonds and forms this impenetrable layer. So let's move on to another. Uh, as we're moving on, if you do have questions, feel free to place them in the chat box at the bottom of your Zoom screen. There should be a little toolbar. And throughout our time together, just remember to keep putting questions in there. And at the end, we will take questions. Uh, I'm not seeing anything. It's all black. OK, thank you for the heads up. We'll see what we can do to bring up the screen again for having some technical difficulties. Thanks for your patience. While we're waiting for that, if you can show us the coyote thistle. OK, we've got picture again. OK. I'm going to pull up the coyote thistle. I don't have a coyote thistle blooming at this time because they only they start blooming in the summer. Um, there's several species of coyote thistle, and they're very interesting because again, these a lot of these plants start growing when things are still when the things are inundated out here when it's wet, with the grasses don't do well. Coyote thistle has a hollow stem, and so it can uh, bring air down from its. Uh, from uh, the leaves will project above the surface of the water. The uh, hollow stems will get air down into the to the roots, and that's one of the ways it gets us a head start on things. Uh, this year we didn't have a, as much water. We may not have even had any water here, so the coyote thistle is not going very well. We do have a picture of a coyote thistle uh, that you can see. Um, they're not truly a thistle, but they. Um, they have a very spiny um, head, and it's interesting because the surest way for me to find if there's coyote thistle around is to sit down and put my hand down on the ground. Now, I may not see it, but invariably I put my hands on them, and they're very, very spiny. Okay, so if we can go back live again. Um, this one's not a very showy one. And this is interesting because this plant wouldn't nor I wouldn't normally see here. This is more of a grassland plant. We'll see it in association um, with rental pools in the areas that are around grassland. And um, this is something that's called blow wives. And blow wives, this is as, as showy as this flower gets, this little yellow flower here. And Liz, if you can show us, we have two slides of blow wives. One slide is showing the flower, and then another uh, slide will show us what it looks like after the flower goes to seed. And the flower picture shows is shows just it's a it's a composite. It's it's kind of you know, dandelion-y a little bit, but it's not a very showy flower. But when it dries out, the top will open up, and you get these white. Um, looks kind of like a dandelion, but it's more robust. Very, uh, very, very uh, strong um, bracts to it. And sometimes you get you, in some uh, guidebooks, such as the Jepson guidebook, we have um, it listed under two sections uh, by color. You have it in the yellow section as well as the the uh, the white section. Um, story that I was told is that there's two kinds of people back in the 1700s, 1800s, when they were when at the when botany was just getting going. Uh, two kinds of people that gave names to plants. They're either priests or farmers. So when you have something like um, you know pink breath of heaven, you can imagine who uh, signed that name. If you have something like blow wives or blue dicks, you can imagine who might have been giving that name. Um, actually, one that we don't have a picture of, well, I'd like to come over here if we can. Not seeing a picture. Okay. I just found one of the very, very few native grasses I expect to see out here. 
Not seeing anything. Okay. Okay, so. I apologize for the technical problems. We've been testing and testing this, and of course it always seems to work out this way. So we're going to move over to another site over here. Certainly you can do that. So I'm moving up a little bit to um, the shoulder of the pond, of the pool. Vernal pools, we talk about different habitats. You have a set, a set of plants that grow in the very bottom, like the, the woolly marbles and the popcorn flower. Then you have the shoulder, where you have some plants that are adapted to being a little bit wetter, but not always wet. And then you get it into the uplands that are around it. And they're all part of the same ecosystem. So what we're going to look at here, OK, I'm not sure what picture you're seeing at this time. The next picture I'd like to see would be a miniature lupin. And there are probably 70 species of lupins in California. Uh, m many of them are grassland or hillside ones. This is one that's a grassland one that grows very often in association with wetlands. And if you can see, I'm not sure if you can see this flower, it's a very, very tiny flower. We're talking about a quarter of an inch or less. So Liz, if you can uh, stop showing photos right now. We have these miniature lupins, appropriately named. Lupinus bicolor is, is the one. Which is interesting because just four or five days ago, I couldn't find any of them going to see. So we're seeing the picture of the of uh, a very nice picture of a mature uh, miniature lupin. They're not as robust as that this year. So Liz, if you can uh, stop showing sharing your screen, I'd appreciate it. Thank you. So here's here's our lupin. The lupins are easy to identify because they have a leaf that is kind of looks like a like a palm of your hand fingers in an array like this. Immediately next to it, this is going to be a little bit difficult to, to see, is this flower. And, and this is a small clover or dwarf sack clover. And if you, it's hard to see unless you, it kind of looks like a cow's udder. Um, an interesting little uh, clover you have out here. And this one is very often in this situation with pools or wetlands. We'll find on the side. We have one that I was actually very surprised to see out here. Um, Douglas's uh, silver puffs, a little um, asteraceae. And it's actually, I'm not 100% convinced I have the right identification. There's two very similar silver puffs types of, of flowers. But this particular one, um, normally it would be much taller than this. And one of the ways we can identify it is that the head comes up and kind of nods over. But these are so short, there's not enough room for them to nod. So I'm pretty sure it's my, the Mycoceros douglasii, which is a... a um, Doug, uh, Douglas silver puffs. And so what this is showing you, every place I find this out here is probably a foot or two outside of the rim of the vernal pool. And But these plants, do t you find them in grasslands, but you find them more commonly uh, near wetlands. There's some very interesting associations between um, locations of these plants. And where we and um, where we see them. Okay. So um, let's move over to this marker over here. I'm not sure what we have out here.
No, actually, that's pretty much the same one we have. Okay. So, actually, let's take a break right now. And I'm wondering if anybody has any questions. So, if you have a question, you can put it in the in the chat, and somebody's going to read it to me. Liz, did we lose you at home? This is our moderator at home, and she's receiving your questions through the chat feature. We have not Mr. received. We have not received any questions. Okay. Okay. So I have a. I have a question. How does this yeah. year compare to last year, as far as the vernal pool flowers? Okay. With where I'm standing, there are. Um, is a, a special kind of a vernal pool. It's more or less an alkali flat, which means it's very dry and very, very flat, and the soils are very alkaline. Um, this year, we didn't have any significant rain in uh, November, December, or January, which is the time usually when these are flooding up. And in this particular spot, the flowers are, just didn't really show up this year. Um, that's not unusual in vernal pools in California. Uh, a lot of these plants are adapted, and the, if, next year, if we get uh, some significant rain, we'll see uh, a, a pretty good bloom here. There are other um, vernal pools that are just very close to this. Um, probably two miles south of us is Glide Tool Ranch, which um, has a different hydrology, and there is a little bit more water there. And there was a pretty good bloom there, but it's going to be very suppressed again, a very short season. Uh, Jepson Prairie is probably uh, 10 or 15 miles to the west of us. Um, there's a very large pool. It's a very, it's a very different habitat than this one. Uh, some similarities. The vernal pool there didn't flood up at all, and, which is interesting because that vernal pool is very large. It's about 15 acres when it's full, and it never, it never flooded up this year. And there are some pretty good blooms in spots there, but it's much suppressed. So this has been a very dry year. And that's interesting because this is something that these plants are adapted to. The plants uh, uh, s drop their seeds. Uh, they, the, not all the seeds will sprout every year. So the seed bank is built up over the years. You have a couple of dry years, it's not a problem. When it floods up again, the plants come back. The, um, the Probably the biggest problem is that we had a bit of a March rain here, and that allowed some of the grasses to start to move into the vernal pool. So if that happens over a period of time, some of the non-native invasive grasses may, may become a bigger problem. Um, Sabrina earlier mentioned that there was sheep in the area. Uh, sheep are one of the management tools we use to protect vernal pools because you bring them in at the proper time, they'll eat the grasses and help suppress the non-native plants in here, allowing the native plants to grow. Another thing that we uh, that I can't show you that we, that we can talk about is we have a couple of endangered and threatened species of crustaceans out here, which there'll be a, a more detailed talk about those. So Charlie, uh, before you, before you go on, we had another question about yes. the pool, the pools. Of, let me find it. it. Says when was the water filled and how much this year? To the best of my knowledge, at this site, this pool never flooded this winter. Uh, it may have gotten damp when we had some rains at, uh, a couple times. But this pool this year never flooded, which is one of the reasons why uh, we're having a hard time showing you any big display of flowers here, because it just didn't happen. Uh, this, this, usually we expect to see our rains, uh, pretty good rains in uh, November, December, January period. And there was pretty much no rain at that time. Uh, the only significant rain that's been out here was uh, in March. And by that time, things were so dry with the north winds that just suck the moisture out of here. So this has been a hard year for vernal pools in general. You know that uh, vernal pools over at Mather and Howard Ranch, which are on the, the other side of the valley, uh, they canceled all their tours. 
because there just wasn't enough to see. Uh, Jefferson Prairie has cut way back on their tours. Um, they're only open on Sundays. They only have docents there on Sundays. Um, and they're not doing formal tours. So this the, this has been a big thing. We have another question. Do vernal pools depend on natural grass fires as part of their ecology? Every habitat in California is adapted to fire in some way. Vernal pools, um, to tell you the truth, the best management tool we would have available to us, I wish was available to us, is fire. Uh, fire does a very good job in removing a lot of the invasive grasses. Uh, the problem is that it's very difficult to get to manage and to get permits to uh, do fires. Um, the government has a hard time with volunteers running around setting fires to things. So the um, we have not been able to do fire here. Uh, at Jefferson Prairie, a number of years ago, uh, there were some fires that were that were uh, allowed, uh, we saw that the, it suppressed the grasses for four or five years after that. Um, it's going to be interesting because there was a, an accidental fire, a wildfire at Jepson Prairie last year in one pasture. And we're, we're looking at the effects of that um, in the vernal pools there. The problem is there just wasn't any water, so we're not getting a lot of plants to come up. So it's, it's hard to see what the effect is. The uh, crustaceans that we'll be talking about, uh, and Liz, if you could show us a picture of of the uh, the fairy shrimp. The fairy shrimp uh, and, and the tadpole shrimp are uh, animals that are adapted to living in the vernal pools, and we have uh, the two species of those have been identified out here: the um, the vernal pool fairy shrimp and the vernal pool tadpole shrimp. Most of those are are um, a little bit further over on the federal property. These animals are well adapted to this kind of situation. Um, one of our presenters in the, in the uh, Flyway Nights program is going to go into much more detail, but the uh, fairy shrimp, as an example, they drop what's called a cyst, which is uh, essentially a, an egg, um, falls to the bottom of the pool, and that cyst can resist the very, very dry conditions, the very harsh conditions you find in a vernal pool. You got three or four or five years uh, without water, no problem. They've taken these cysts and you can dip them in nitrogen, liquid nitrogen, and they're still viable afterwards. They've taken these cysts and put them in a Bunsen burner a flame, and they, they're still viable. And in fact, uh, one species of fairy shrimp assists were placed on the outside of one of the Apollo capsules as it went around the moon. And when they came back, they found that they were still viable. Um, there's been some, some studies where they brought up some, uh, some cysts that were buried underground in, in the Salt Lake area. And they estimate these cysts were in a soil area that was thousands of years old. They found some of those were still viable when they put them in the proper conditions. So situations like we have now, where we have a drought in California and maybe multiple years before there's water in these pools, these animals are well adapted to that. Get the right conditions and those, the, some of those cysts will uh, develop into the animals that have that complete their life cycle in just a few weeks. And uh, let's see if we can put up the tadpole shrimp. That's uh, a similar species. A tadpole shrimp is a bit larger. Uh, they can get to be as large as my thumb, perhaps. Um, uh, have a similar, uh, maybe not quite as persistent, but they can, their, their eggs uh, can last, again, multiple years through dry cycles. So uh, a blip like this is not going to be a, a big problem uh, for animals like that. When we're talking about vernal pool habitats, we're talking about places that have been, it's taken hundreds of thousands of years of, uh, to create. And uh, the animals and the plants that are adapted to this are, used, are, are well adapted to these very dry and harsh conditions. Are there any other questions, Liz? Let's give people a minute to think about it.
the interesting thing about this particular spot is that these are very, very, very shallow pools. There's really only a foot of difference between the bottom of the pool and, the, and what we will call the uplands around it. Uh, if you go to vernal pools on the um, on the eastern side of the valley, you get vernal pools that can be several feet deep very easily. Uh, the ones we also have some um, several uh, endangered plants that are here, uh, and that's an interesting thing because there's vernal pools. Like I said, there's there's a pool a complex just a few miles south of us. There's a, another pool complex that's uh, 10 miles to the west of us. Each of these pools have differences. Even though they have the same kind of basis, they're still all clay pan pools around here. Uh, they, there, there's, a, there's a lot of similarities, but there's a lot of differences. So you have some questions? We have uh, two more, two questions. Yes. Are vernal pools located throughout California? Yes, we don't have a graphic that shows this. Uh, there's vernal pools in pretty much every portion of California, except for in the uh, northeastern corner, like Humboldt and that area, the forests up there, and not in the not so much in the Sierras, although there are some up there, and not as much in the desert area as much because there's just not enough rainfall down there to, to flood pools up. But all throughout the Central Valley, um, historically, there are hundreds of thousands of acres of vernal pools in the Central Valley of California. And the majority of the vernal pools are in the Central Valley, going into the coast ranges a little bit down around the Bay Area, uh, Santa Rosa, an area. Um, that there's some very good ones down in San Diego area as well. The problem is that we, you know, I, I mentioned that in that soil layer, that impenetrable soil layer. If you do something that breaks that impenetrable soil layer, you've killed the vernal pool. So in the Central Valley, there's something called deep ripping, where they come through and and uh, break that soil layer, so you can plant an orchard, um, so the trees can get the roots down to the underlying water tables that are deep. And you also have places places where there's housing development where they'll uh, dig uh, trenches for uh, irrigation lines and um, sewer lines and things like this. And once you've broken those, t those, so those soil layers, you've killed the vernal pool. We estimate that there's roughly only 10% of the historical vernal pool areas in the Central Valley remaining when you compare it to what it was before the European settlers here. So protecting these vernal pools is very, very important. There's a lot of biodiversity here. There's a lot of plants that own and animals that live only in vernal pools. And it's very, very important to protect them. Um, and it, the way it is now, it takes a lot of management for these areas. We have uh, of that 10% that's remaining, um, only a fraction of that are in areas that are protected in some way, such as in a, uh, a nature reserve or a conservancy or a wildlife area. So um, it's something that we really have to protect. Is there another question? Yes, there's several more questions. Is there a history of floods in the vernal pools? That's a really interesting question when we talk about the Yolo Basin area. Um, there's a vernal pool area in the Yolo Bypass. It's Glide Tool Ranch. Uh, we've, uh, the Old Basin in the past has had some tours there, and hopefully we'll get back to being able to do tours after the pandemic is over. The, um, and that, in many years, is a, a typical vernal pool where the water uh, only comes, vernal pools tend, the water pretty much is, only comes from rainfall. They're, you don't have a spring or a river. But in the bypass, we know that the Yolo Bypass floods some years. And sometimes that flooding reaches some of these vernal pool areas. And that um, is probably one of the factors that makes some of these uh, vernal pools in these flood areas very different than the ones that are not in the flood areas. The one where I'm standing in, we don't usually get a flooding event out here because um, you can't, it's hard to see, but if you look off in the distance, this is places flat as a pancake. And 
there's not a lot of room for water to, to move laterally here. So this area doesn't really flood in the, unless we have a, uh, a massively torrential rainfall. Um, but some vernal pool areas, you do have inundation. And um, that that's one of the reasons why we have so many different kinds. Uh, any other questions? Yes, if someone doesn't see flowers walking around, where is a good place to look to find flowers? What can we look for to find the little flowers? Um, vernal pools, the problem with that is a lot of vernal pools are in protected areas, so it's difficult to see them. Um, places you can go to, Jepson Prairie is a place that you can go to see vernal pool flowers. Uh, year round, you can see them now, and we have um, we'll have docents on site on Sundays between ten and noon, uh, at least for another couple of weeks. In a in a normal year, which this isn't, uh, Mather Fields there are some very good vernal pools. Howard Ranch uh, out at Rancho Seco there are very good vernal pools. Um, these are all areas that have that are available to the public uh, that you can see them in at the right time of year. Uh, typically, we talk about uh, middle of March through uh, end of April for vernal pools. Uh, some areas can be a little longer. If you're just looking for flowers in general, um, right now, North Table Mountain near Oroville is a wonderful place for wildflowers. Um, it has some similarities to a vernal pool because they have an impenetrable layer there, which is an, a, a, a volcanic layer, soil layer. Uh, but it's not what I call a traditional vernal pool, but there's a lot of flowers right now. Um, the problem with that is it's it's very publicly accessible. It's very well known. If you go on a weekend, um, it's very hard to get in there because parking is crazy. Um, there's a number of different um, wildflower areas in that are blooming right now. Um, if you want to see flower, wildflowers in general, uh, Hype Cove near Yosemite, uh, a lot of places in Napa. Uh, I was just on Mount Tamalpais uh, two days ago, and there's some beautiful wildflower hikes there. Um, what I think we're going to see this this year is a very shortened wildflower season. Things are starting to dry up in a lot of places, especially with the winds that we're having. Any other? Um, okay, so we're looking at something over here. No, we've seen everything. Okay, I'm sorry. Um, another question. We don't have any more questions. Okay. Um, let's go and look over here and want to talk about this. Uh, here's an area. This is what is going to happen to a vernal pool if we don't have it managed quite a bit. Very pretty purple flower here, but this is this is a, a non-native one from uh, from the Mediterranean, and this is uh, winter vetch or hairy vetch, and you can see it's got a lot of tendrils. It's very bushy here. Um, ranchers and farmers like this. In fact, this was brought in. It's a nitrogen fixer, so. This is something that's that's a good cover crop, and which is why it was brought in uh, in orchards and places like this. And it's something. This is it's something indicative of why we need. We don't have a photo of this, unfortunately. Uh, it is a non-native one, and the problem with it, first of all, you can see it's a fairly tall plant, so it tends to smother things. It's not not really invasive. But the biggest problem is that we have some very, very poor soils here. This plant is improving the soil by putting nitrogen in there. And the native plants aren't really adapted to take advantage of that high nitrogen. But these grasses that we see around here, these non-native grasses, uh, soft chest as an example here, and there's some barleys, some foxtails out here and wild oats. Um, these things really like the soils being improved. So this purple flower plant in here is improving the soil, makes it advantageous to these non-native European grasses. And that's, I'm going to reach, just reach across you here. 
showing here's here's something that any you, a lot of people have seen. This is a, a wild oat. Uh, wild oats are are again a Mediterranean type of plant. Um, we have a Mediterranean climate, so a lot of the the plants that came in from the Mediterranean area do very well here. But the the, the problem is that these plants don't have the things that suppress them as they do in the Mediterranean area that, where they came from. Um, where they came from, there's insects and fungi and things that keep these in check, and those things didn't really come over here. So they're saying, you know, all right, now we got this, we're, we got some nitrogen from this plant. We don't have the bad guys that are keeping these in check. They just explode and take over. So we get a lot of thatch, and a lot, you can see here's a lot of dead material here. And this is thatch from prior years. And as these grasses uh, grow and then die, this thatch builds up and it suppresses the native plants. The native plants tend to be very low growing because um, they're short statured. You notice all the plants I showed you before when we were talking about the native plants were way flat on the ground. Um, oh, there's an interesting one. There's digging around, I found this is a different clover. Um, I don't have a picture, an online picture of this one. Um, it's hard to see which clover it is, but that is a native clover. So it's struggling along down here underneath this, and it's trying to come up through this thatch, and the, the thatch of the non-native plants is smothering things. Um, someone asked a question about fire. That's a really good reason for why we wish we had fire out here. Um, the fire is going to take care of this thatch. The sheep grazing, we want to get the sheep on here when the, when the plants are green and growing. They, don't, they won't eat thatch unless, unless they don't have a choice. And um, when they get down to eat the thatch, they're, they're, they're kind of hard on things. Charlie, we have a question about the sheep grazing. Are there yes. unwanted side effects from using sheep to graze? And do they ever use goats to graze? Um, Three kinds of animals that you use for grazing, sheep, goats, and cattle. And, uh, and then hopefully um, fire if, if we have the options. Um, goats are not my first choice. Uh, goats eat everything right down to the ground. They're very hard on things. And if you move goats, people tend to move goats from one pasture to another quite a bit um, to use them for fire control. And so they have a tendency to bring in a lot of uh, weeds with them. Uh, so they're very hard on things. Do we, uh, another question is, can you tell us about the endangered grasses that are there? Sure, let, let me just f finish one thing about the, the, um, the sheep and goats and stuff. Uh, goats are my last choice. Sheep would be, are a good choice, but sheep tend to like to eat the forbs, the types of plants, the flowering plants, more than grasses. But they're good because they're lightweight. Uh, cattle are the best in some senses because cattle eat grass first and the grasses are the problems uh, that we have out here. But cattle tend to be uh, a little heavier. Um, we're experimenting at Jepson Prairie with using cattle. It's traditionally a sheep area. And cattle can be done if they're managed properly. Um, so, you know, my, my first choice would be properly managed cattle. Um, I'm sorry, the, there was, a, I forgot what the that next question was. The next question was, can you tell us about the endangered grasses that are there? Yes, um, Liz, mm -hmm. if you can put up a picture of either Solano grass or Calusa grass, um, either one of those. Um, we have both, these are two federally listed uh, grasses. Uh, I can't show them to you now because one, they're on a different part of the property because they are federally protected, and two, we don't see them until the summer. Um, the Solano grass and Calusa grass are um, very hardy grasses that, that um, it's interesting, uh, 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 one of the speakers we'll have later on, Carol Witham, uh, has told me that if you if you taste these grasses, they taste like they're a cross between battery acid and tobacco juice. Now, I've I've asked her several times how she knows what battery acid tastes like, but the um, they're they're very very acidic, and and so the 
the grazing animals won't eat them. Um, they're um, found in just a few places. One of them was found originally at Jepson Prairie, and we thought it was it was uh, uh, we thought it was, had gone extinct. We could no one could find it for a while until it was found on this site. And the grasslands regional site was rediscovered here, and seeds are, from those are being collected to reintroduce it back to some other vernal pool areas. Um, so that, that's a very, um, the Tectoria, uh, is, Tectoria mucanata is, is, is uh, uh, that very, very special grass. So I think we have just a few more minutes for the last questions. I don't see any more questions. Okay. Uh, Liz, if you can find a plant, there's a plant called Extraplex. Oh, no, no, excuse me. Let's do the, the Chloropyron. Um, palmate beak. Not sure what we call it. That's a common name that I have a hard time remembering what the full name is. It'll be very close to the in your list to that one. Um, let's see. Uh, palmate bracted bird's beak. Okay, there's there's another one that's a very rare plant out here. Um, these are alkali type plants. They love alkali, and I don't know if you, oh, there you have a picture of that. Not quite. Um, yet. Not the greatest um, looking plant, but if you're a botanist, it's very exciting because that's found in very few places. Um, that particular photo actually was taken in uh, the Woodland uh, Regional Park. Uh, the new park that they're just establishing up in, in, in Woodland, which is very similar to the one here. Um, so there, there's a number of very, very rare plants. And these are plants that are, they're not necessarily beautiful plants that you go out to take wonderful pictures of, but they're very special and they're limited to these very, very harsh conditions out here. Things are very, very alkaline out here. Uh, any other questions? Yes. Which wild mammals use the site? Mammals, okay. Uh, we have ground squirrels out here, um, which is really important because the ground squirrels make burrows and the burrows are where the burrowing owls live in. Uh, burrowing owls can't make their own burrows. Uh, and there's an extensive burrowing owl colony out here on a different part of the, of the uh, grasslands park, a uh, different area we can't go into. Um, there, um, we just saw jackrabbits today as we were walking in here. So a lot of your typical grassland animals. The um, we don't that I'm aware of have the P Boda's uh, pocket bur uh, gopher out here. I think it there may be pocket gophers on part of the site, but the pocket gophers um, I don't see any indication of them in the area of these vernal pools. Uh, pocket gophers are very very important in some vernal pool areas. Uh, they move a lot of dirt and they create a lot of uh, interesting topology in places. But um, this place is so very flat, uh, I just haven't seen any indication of that. Um, there may be other mammals out here. I'll admit that I'm more of a botanist than I am a uh, zoologist, so I'm not familiar with all the different animals that are out here. Charlie, we have one time for one last question. Last question, yes. How do we access the pools at Mather? Um, they're right by the road. I don't recall which road they are. Um, and I guess the best I can say is I, I can give you directions. Um, I've written an article about them. Um, if you email me at charlie, C-H-A-R-L-I-E, at I, the letter I, break, B R A K E, for, which is F O R, wildflowers.com. I'd be happy to give you directions to Mather. Um, I also have uh, directions to places like North Table Mountain and uh, other places uh, like that. Uh, and I'm, I'm happy to answer emails. And with that, we'll turn it back over to Sabrina. Thank you very much.
Just want to say thank you all for joining us out here today at the Vernal Pools at Grasslands Regional Park. Just a quick reminder that we do have the scavenger hunt going on continually right now through April 11th out at the Yolo Bypass Wildlife Area. We also have our Vernal Pool Speaker Series, which is happening um, every other Tuesday for the next few weeks. So April 13th is on Vernal Pool Fairy Shrimp and Tadpole Shrimp. Uh, April 27th is um, a close look at Grasslands Regional Park history and also the uh, Vernal, or excuse me, the Burrowing Owl Preserve that is nearby the Vernal Pools we are in, also inaccessible to the public. So it'd be great for you to join us on April 27th to hear more about the Burrowing Owl Preserve that's also on site up here. And on May 11th, um, with Carol Witham, which Charlie just mentioned, looking specifically at Vernal Pool plant life, uh, learning more of the details about the plants, uh, some of the ones we saw out here and, and many others as well. Again, I want to say thank you all for joining us. I want to thank uh, Liz at home for moderating our questions and sharing pictures. I want to thank Colette, who's our videographer behind the camera right now. And I want to give a special thanks to Charlie for being our tour guide. What a wealth of knowledge we gained from him today. And we hope that you will all join us uh, again for one of these tours. We have different tour guides that are presenting and sharing their knowledge each time. Uh, our next one is Wednesday, April 21st in the evening. Um, please share with your friends. Again, thank you so much for joining us. You all have a great rest of your weekend.